September 14, 2008, Aeroflot Flight 821, a Boeing 737 with 88 people on board, is preparing to land in Perm, Russia after a two-hour flight from Moscow. While approaching the Perm airport, the aircraft has a last-minute change in their approach pattern. The captain seems upset and exchanges some terse words with the air traffic controller. The controller asks the crew if everything is okay because they keep missing turns and begin climbing when they should be descending. The crew becomes overwhelmed with the landing procedure and the first officer can no longer control the plane. He asks the captain to take over, but the captain refuses, stating that he can't do it either. The plane rolls 360 degrees and slams into a railroad tracks, killing all on board. What happened to Aeroflot 821? Why could neither pilot control the plane? Find out on this episode of Black Box Down. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Black Box Down. It's Gus and Chris. We are back. Hello, Chris. Hello. Talking about an Aeroflot flight that happened a few years ago. What is that, like 13 years ago now? Yeah. Before we get into the meat of it, as always, got to ask everyone, please follow us on social media at Black Box Down Pod, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We post lots of supplemental content. Mm, I'm not sure what I'm going to post for this one. I'll have to think about it. We'll see if we come up with anything during while we're recording this episode to see what I can post. Yeah. And if you're following us already... Give us a retweet or a share or something, because that helps. Yeah. Oh, actually, I do know what I need to post. I don't want to say it yet, because it's a spoiler okay. for the episode. Ooh. But I do have an... I'm going to make a quick note for myself here. I'll make sure to point it out when we get to that point of the episode that I'll be posting online. Okay, so Aeroflot Flight 821 was a passenger flight, like I said, from Moscow to Perm on September 14th, 2008. The flight was crewed by Captain Rodion Medvedev who was 34 years old and had over 3,900 flight hours, and First Officer Rustam Alaberdin, who was 43 and had over 8,900 flight hours. The aircraft used was a 16-year-old Boeing 737 with 44,533 hours and 35,104 cycles. There were 82 passengers and four flight attendants, in addition to the two pilots. The pre-flight briefing was conducted in compliance with standard procedures and the flight took off from Moscow at 9.13 p.m. UTC and climbed to 29,000 feet. The flight operated normally and at 10.45 p.m. UTC, a little over an hour and a half after takeoff, the crew started a descent from 29,000 feet and was tracking towards waypoint Mendeleevo. After passing over this waypoint, air traffic control cleared the flight to fly over runway 21 at a heading of 110 degrees. Air traffic control then instructed the flight to turn right and fly downwind of the runway. When the plane was at about 2,000 feet, the crew made their base turn, but then the aircraft started to climb to over 4,200 feet. The aircraft then rolled 360 degrees over the left wing and collided with the ground at 11.10 p.m. UTC. The aircraft was destroyed in the crash and fire and everyone was killed. So, like lots of times in these incidents, everything was fine, everything was normal. Uh -huh. Then all of a sudden, everything falls apart was wrong <laughs> yeah i mean i've listened to the cockpit voice recorder for this incident and i mean it's in russian so i can't you know understand it uh -huh. but listening to it it seems like things are a little weird but the plane's still flyable and then uh -huh. all of a sudden within 30 seconds they go from flying to crashed you know in the ground yeah. it's, it's it just rapidly falls apart that's scary <laughs> yeah it really is so the investigation was carried out by the Russian Interstate Aviation Commission. During the investigation, the committee looked at the engine systems to see if anything went wrong. And they found that on this plane, the TCAS and the auto throttle were inoperative. And if you remember, we've talked about TCAS before. It's the collision avoidance system that you know, lets a plane know if it's going to collide with another plane to either pull up or dive or you know uh -huh, which way to uh -huh. turn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it negotiates conflict and then tells both planes how to avoid the collision. Yeah, so that they don't both turn the same direction or something. Yeah, exactly. So that was broken. And the auto throttle was also inoperative, you know, which is, like it says, it, <laughs> it controls the throttle on the plane so that the pilots don't have to worry about it. And these were known? It was known that these were not working on the plane. But even though they weren't working, it was the minimum equipment list showed they were still allowed to fly this plane. They weren't necessary for, for the plane to fly, but they were not working. Is that standard for all airlines or just... Okay, so the minimum equipment list is prepared by the operator of the aircraft. So in this case, it would be the, the airline, right? And they uh -huh. come up with the minimum equipment list. And the minimum equipment list is approved by the operator's National Airworthiness Authority. So in this case, Aeroflot sets the minimum equipment list, and then the government agency for Russia approves it. So that, that's cool for Russia, but maybe not for other countries? I don't know for certain about the United States, but uh -huh. I'm reading on the FAA website a document. It's Advisory Circular 120-55C, in Appendix 3 of that document. It seems like in the United States, 
it's up to the carrier. Okay. To the individual airline. It seems like, according to the FAA, the TCAS may be an operative provided the system is deactivated and secured and the on route and approach procedures do not require it in its use. It seems like that's consistently what it says about TCAS in this circular, which was released in February of 2011. So uh, it looks like it's up to each individual carrier in the United States. So much like here in Russia, like we're talking about. I learned something, Chris. That's a good question. I don't want to badmouth Russia, really, but I was just like, is this a Russia thing? <laughs> <laughs> it seems like it's up to the carrier. I can't say I don't know for certain what each carrier says about that in the United States, but it, yeah. it doesn't seem like it's necessarily required. But anyway, so that's, you know, we're talking here about the TCAS. But instead, what I want to talk about for a bit is the auto throttle, specifically on this particular plane. Uh huh. The Russian Interstate Aviation Committee noted that there had been a recorded problem with the auto throttle on this specific plane for over a month. And the fact that this system was not fixed showed a low level of Boeing 737 maintenance within the airline. However, the investigation team did not find any evidence of other aircraft system failures or engine failures that happened during the flight. What was going on with this particular plane, I should say, was that the engines were not outputting the same amount of power. The right engine was consistently producing about 20% more power than the left engine. Okay. So when they were flying, they had to have the throttle set at different powers in order to try to balance them out. Otherwise, it would roll? It would want to bank to the left because the right engine was producing more power, which was generating more lift, which was kind of making them yaw to the left. And mm -hmm. the additional lift was also making the right wing lift up more. So it was also banking to the left a bit. Okay. So they had to give more throttle to the left side, decrease it to the right side, in order to try to maintain stable flight. Okay, and but they knew this. They knew this. This particular plane had had this problem for over a month. Okay. I wouldn't want to be flying that plane, but... <laughs> yeah, it seems like it's something that should have been fixed. Yeah. There's speculation that the airline industry at the time was kind of in... How can I put it? It was, it was not that great in Russia at that time. And some things were kind of falling by the wayside. Maintenance wasn't being taken care of as quickly as it should have. Okay. So... The committee found that there were serious violations in the flight operation management, work and rest management, and control of flight operations for this airline. Also, the professional training of the flight crew was conducted on the basis of the flight crew training manual developed by the airline and approved by the Russian aviation authorities. This flight crew training manual had serious deviations from civil aviation regulatory documents in terms of flight crew training, crew formation, and documentation. So their whole training was mm -hmm. kind of messed up. You know, it was approved by the regulatory agencies, but it really didn't make sense. It wasn't great. It wasn't as good as it should have been. Okay. The captain for this plane had transitioned to the Boeing 737 at the Flight Training International Center in Denver in August and September of 2006, which is two years before. And at the time, that center was not approved by the Russian aviation authorities. The program he attended was also designed for training co-pilots, not pilots in command. <laughs> so it wasn't for captains. It was for first officers. So his trait hit the wrong training. Right. The pilot in command's personal file does not contain all of the training documentation, which does not allow adequate assessment of the pilot in command's progress and instructor remarks. Also, this captain only had previous flight experience in a Russian plane, which is the Antonov AN-2, which is a single propeller aircraft, and the Tupolev Tu-134. Then the Tu-134, it looks, it, it kind of reminds me of the McDonnell Douglas MD-80 and the DC-9 where the two engines are on the back of the plane. I'm sure you've seen planes uh -huh, like that, uh -huh. where the two engines, are, they're not under the wings, they're like at the back of the plane. So he didn't have experience on aircraft with spaced apart engines, which, and when they're spaced apart like that, asymmetric thrust affects them a lot more. Yeah. When the two engines are close together at the back, if one's producing more power than the other, it's still generally pushing the plane forward. It's not a huge difference. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Physics. Right, exactly. <laughs> and on top of that, he didn't have experience of flying with a two-member crew aircraft with a glass cockpit, flight management system, and the Western-type attitude indicator. Those other plane he flew, like the Tupolev Tu-134, was a four-crew aircraft. Uh, it had a, an engineer and a navigator as well as the two pilots. So, you know, now when there's only two people, they have to take on a lot more responsibility. They have to know a lot more about the plane. How did he become the captain? That's a good question, Chris. I don't know. I mean, he didn't have the appropriate training. He really didn't know how to fly this plane, but here he is, captain for some reason. And I kind of glossed over something in that last sentence that I do want to dig into a little bit. I said that he didn't have experience with a Western type of attitude indicator. 
I'm not a pilot, right? I've said that many times. Even if you're not a pilot, you might be familiar with what an attitude indicator looks like in the cockpit. It's like that marker that represents the aircraft and the horizon line. It normally like it's a circle and the top half of it is blue and the bottom half of it's brown. And it's got like little markers on it for the wing. So that way when the plane's like turning one direction or another, you can see Mm -hmm. what the plane is doing in relation to the horizon. Yeah. Uh, It shows you like if you're banking, if you're pitching up or down. Well, the way that it works on Western type aircrafts is the lines for the plane's wings are fixed they don't move and the horizon turns and moves with the aircraft marker staying still but in planes like the tupolev 134 the attitude indicator works oppositely the horizon is fixed and the aircraft marker moves okay so when you look at them you know if you're looking at a western style it might look like you're banking left but on the russian style it would look like you're banking right if you're not used to looking at it why would they why why would they do that it's just like a philosophical difference it's all relative right yeah, I guess it's also, it's like Americans use the imperial measurement. It's like, <laughs> why? Uh, well, I, w- I would say it's like when you're looking at, you know, a Western style indicator, everything's in relation to the plane. That's why the horizon changes. But when you're looking at the Russian style, the horizon's the constant and the plane is what's changing in relation to it. So it's really like, what point of view are you looking at this from? Yeah. Which is the constant. You know, really, the horizon doesn't move. It's the plane that's moving, if you want to get, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. But from your perspective in the plane, the plane is constant and it looks like the horizon's moving. It's just two different ways to approach this. And the plane he was used to flying did it one way. And now he's went through bad training and his, the indicator in this plane shows it the opposite way. Mm. But he knows this. Yeah, he should know this. I mean, he's flown this plane before, and he went through, I mean, not great training, but he did go through training. Yeah. Before he even went to that training in Denver, he had no experience as a captain. He did not pass the captain training courses. Like he failed them or just didn't take them? He didn't take them. And even though he transitioned from the Tupolev 134, which I said requires four people in the cockpit, he did not pass the crew resource management training. So he failed? Yeah. Okay. I think so. I can't tell you for certain. Like I said, his file was missing some documentation. I believe that he did not pass CRM training. I cannot say that with 100% certainty, though. And at the time of this accident, he had almost 1,200 hours in a 737, of which 477 were as a captain. Again, even though he wasn't qualified to be a captain. So then you're like, okay, well, the captain's not great. Hopefully the first officer is qualified to fly this plane. Give you a little bit of a spoiler. He's not. (laughs) <laughs> I think this yeah I <laughs> yeah and I even said at the beginning you know of this episode that when you know things are going wrong the first officer is asking the captain to take over and the captain's saying I can't do it <laughs> I can't imagine this scenario the first officer also had similar aircraft experience as the captain he also only flew the Antonov AN2 and the Tupolev 134 and he also did not have experience in western style planes like the Boeing 737 during simulator training there were numerous instructors remarks that the First officer should pay more attention to the standard operating procedure, especially regarding call-outs, CRM, and the distribution of pilot flying and pilot monitoring duties. These problems connected with the transition from Russian aircraft to Western ones. They've been noticed before with regard to other flight crews involved in previous accidents. It's not an easy transition to make. Uh -uh. The instructors also noted the uh, first officer's insufficient level while making flights with thrust asymmetry and recommended that he should pay more attention to the attitude and speed control during approach and guess what they had thrust asymmetry on this flight and his instructors have noted hey he's not good at (laughs) dealing with this (laughs) so during the commissioning and training of the co-pilot and the flight crew training manual was also not fully complied with for example the final training flights during the commissioning were executed with the same instructor who did the training and issued the certificate the same instructor also trained to check the co-pilot and allowed him to fly as a co-pilot By the time of the accident, he had 236 flight hours on a Boeing 737. So again, not a whole ton of flight time on this particular plane. I mean, combined, what? That's less than 1,000 hours between the two of them combined. Uh Uh-huh. Probably closer to 700 or 800. And so the same guy who he certified both of them? It was the same instructor who trained him and issued his certificate. Okay. Speaking about the first officer, allowed him to fly. Okay. This particular flight we're talking about, Air Flight 821, it was the third flight that both the captain and the first officer had flown together. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, they, they spent time together in the past. The operating procedures and the distribution of duties in a two-member crew differ significantly from those in a crew that also include a flight engineer and uh, navigator. Flight operations on a two-member crew aircraft with modern avionics require that the pilot should have theoretical knowledge of how this equipment works 
and practical experience of such operations. Again, this is just reinforcing. When there's two people instead of four, the two people need to really know their stuff and be able to manage these systems. And they didn't. <laughs> yeah, and it's obvious so far they did not. When applicants are selected for transitioning, one of the main issues to consider should be professional skills of the pilots and their ability to properly operate aircraft instruments and cooperate in abnormal situations. I don't know how many times we've talked about this, Chris. Mm -hmm. Communication is so key when things go wrong, right? It seems like whenever there's an incident we talk about, there's a breakdown in CRM or a breakdown in communication. You know, having pilots who know how to fly and who are able to communicate when under stress is so key. Mm -hmm. I, I just really want to emphasize that because there was obviously communication breakdown here. Yeah. Well, he didn't pass his communication he, thing. Yeah, he failed his CRM test. So as mentioned before, neither the pilot in command nor the co-pilot had previous experience flying a two-member crew aircraft with modern avionics. Besides that, the pilot in command had not had any experience as captain before he transitioned to the Boeing 737. So he was never a captain. Then they transitioned him to a new plane. They were like, all right, you're a captain now. Like he never, he never spent time as a first officer after transitioning to this plane. Like he never spent any other practical time learning. Yeah. So what happened here is an inexperienced co-pilot was assigned to a captain who was also inexperienced. He didn't have enough experience in this position. Uh, and both of them were being accustomed to multi-crew operations. So they're kind of setting them up for failure here. Yeah. So the committee noticed that during the taxi and takeoff, standard operating procedures were not followed by the crew. The standard operating procedure shows that the pilot in command was supposed to be the one taxiing to the runway and then transfer controls to the first officer after he's lined up with the runway. Then the first officer was to increase the thrust to 40 to 60% N1 and then press the toga button, the takeoff go around button, after matching N1. Then thrust adjustment should be completed before reaching 60 knots. After the thrust is adjusted, the captain should then take control of the throttles in case of a rejected takeoff and hold his hand on the throttles before V1 is reached and then adjust takeoff thrust manually if needed. So that's what they're supposed to do, right? They have uh -huh. this procedure they're supposed to follow. Instead, what happened was the increased thrust 55 degrees before lining up, which led to 70.5% N1. N1 is just like the power being output from the engine. So 70.5% N1 in the left engine and 84% N1 in the right engine. Of course, this is dangerous because of asymmetry and thrust, which leads to yaw movement, which means that the plane might leave the runway because it's, you know, it's not going straight. It's having asymmetric thrust. Mm -hmm. So probably at about the same moment the thrust increased, the pilot in command handed control over to the co-pilot as the full left rudder was used to enter the takeoff course and then full right rudder was applied to compensate for the yaw movement caused by the thrust asymmetry. So they're not going straight down the runway. They're starting to turn. So uh -huh. instead of adjusting the thrust, they're applying rudder inputs to try to keep the plane straight on the runway as they're taking off. So that Okay, yeah. So they're trying to use essentially like the steering wheel instead of adjusting the thrust. Yeah, they're probably using the pedals, but same thing. So as the aircraft rolled down the runway and reached 90 knots, the first officer had to apply full rudder to maintain course. Uh -huh. So, I mean, this is not the way you're supposed to do this. So from the beginning, from the moment they take off, they're already off to a bad start. It's already messed up. Wait, so, and when did, when did that happen? That's at takeoff. That's when they're leaving Moscow. They already don't know what they're doing. Is this their first time on this flight, on this plane? Their third time flying together. Right. right, and they both have several hundred hours flying on a 737. I forget well, what I mean, it was. The this specific plane with the, with the oh, issues. I don't know. I can't answer that for certain. I believe this is their first time in this specific plane, but they would know, they would have known that there was asymmetric thrust and that they needed to compensate for it. And they also would have known that the auto throttle was inoperative and the TCAS was inoperative. So yeah, I mean, they would have been briefed on this. Fall is always a busy scramble, but one thing I can cut from my list is going to the grocery store thanks to HelloFresh. HelloFresh recipes save time you'd otherwise spend meal planning, shopping, and chopping so you can get back to what matters. With HelloFresh, you get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. You get to skip trips to the grocery store because HelloFresh makes home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh's family-friendly menu is a big win for back-to-school season with easy, delicious recipes for drama-free dinners. And the fall harvest is officially on with HelloFresh. Count on seasonal recipes like pumpkin cinnamon rolls as well as fresh, high-quality ingredients that travel from the farm to your front door in less than a week. You know I say it all the time. There's just something nice about getting to the kitchen and just making some stuff with HelloFresh. You know, I work during the day, and when I'm done, it's like, it, it's just kind of like, like a me time where I get to like just sit down, focus, work on this real quick project that at the end you get to eat and it's delicious. 
So go to HelloFresh.com slash BlackBoxDown14. Use code BlackBoxDown14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. That's up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. HelloFresh.com slash BlackBoxDown14 with code BlackBoxDown14. That's BlackBoxDown in the number one and the number four. Want an entertaining, informative podcast to look forward to each week? Something other than Black Box Down, maybe? Then check out The Jordan Harbinger Show. It's a top-shelf podcast named Best of Apple Podcasts in 2018. Jordan dives into the minds of fascinating people from authors and scientists to mobsters, spies, and hostage negotiators. Jordan has a talent for getting his guests to share thought-provoking insights, and he pulls out tactical pieces of wisdom in every episode to help you become a better-informed, critical thinker. I mean, it's amazing the roster of guests that he has talked to and had on his show. It's amazing. I mean, if you just go take a quick look, you're going to find someone that you want to hear more about. I guarantee you, uh, you, sh- you should definitely go take a look. I, I guarantee you're not going to miss it. And uh, the conversations are so great. They provide so much useful info. I can't recommend it enough. Jordan's recently interviewed a YouTuber who exposes guru scammers and a researcher who studies what turns ordinary people into conspiracy theorists. The Jordan Harbinger Show is smart, funny, easy to listen to, so you can't go wrong with adding The Jordan Harbinger Show to your rotation. It's incredibly interesting. There's never a dull show. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Going online without ExpressVPN is like leaving your kids with the nearest stranger while you use the restroom. It's probably fine, but you don't know if that person can be trusted. That's why they taught us stranger dangerous kids. Remember that? Well, connecting to the internet is kind of the same way. When you're on an unencrypted network, your data is not safe. Any hacker that happens to be on that network can access and steal your personal data. But you can protect yourself with ExpressVPN. It creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so hackers can't steal your sensitive information. It would take a hacker with a supercomputer a millennia of millennia to get past ExpressVPN's encryption. It's so easy to install and use. Uh, the way I use it, it's just a button on my browser. I click it to turn it on, click it to turn it off. It's, I mean, it's so simple. It, it's just a couple of clicks to install. It's a couple of clicks to turn it on, turn it off. There's no reason not to use it. I mean, I really can't think of a downside. So secure your online data today by visiting expressvpn.com slash blackboxdown. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash blackboxdown. You get an extra three months free, expressvpn.com slash blackboxdown. So we're going to start getting into something else here. I know you probably have a lot of questions <laughs> running through your head right now. We're going to start scratching at some of that. We're going to start answering some of that. Uh huh. The report about this incident also notes that the speech of both pilots was full of expletive words and unjustified spiteful remarks concerning the flight attendants and the airport control service as well as dispersed discourse not related directly to the current tasks, which distracted them from the urgent flight control tasks. So, I mean, they were just like cursing up a storm and just like, (laughs) I don't know, like making really snide, snippy comments to each other while they're flying and about the flight attendants and other people they're working with. It's really unprofessional. It's really, really bizarre. This mentioned behavior hampered the optimum operational concentration of the crew on the whole, leading to fragmentation and distortion of the actual flight situation image, which, in case of unexpected complication and changes of flight conditions, inevitably leads to erroneous action. So Mm -hmm. they're distracted. They're like chatting about non-related stuff, cursing up a storm, being really unprofessional. So they're not paying attention fully to the flight. So when things go wrong, things go really wrong. Yeah. So when they started their descent, they expected to take the Mendeleevo 4 alpha approach pattern but they were instructed instead to take the Mendeleevo 4 Bravo pattern, which would take them to the outer marker before coming back towards runway 21. So they were expecting to come in and land one way, but then air traffic control told them to go kind of a roundabout way because there was another plane taking off from runway 3 instead of 21 because of a tailwind and air traffic control needed to space them out a bit. So already, like I said, these guys are already unprofessional and cursing at each other. So this starts a chain of frustration and confusion from the crew Mostly the captain. Uh huh. The air traffic controller had to explain a couple of times to him why they were taking the 4B approach and the pilot in command was kind of impatient. He kept asking stuff like, so what are we going to do? And was questioning the controller on when the other aircraft was going to depart. The crew then started to discuss what their next turn would be. The captain thought they were going to turn left, but the first officer thought it would be to the right. Then the controller instructs them, turn right, but... They didn't clarify that the runway landing course would be used. So how do they not know which direction to go? Is it, They don't know. They're just, they're confused. Like, I think the whole time 
like I said, they were expecting to come in one way. Mm -hmm. And like I said, they were distracted, all this other stuff's going on. Then it gets changed on them and they hadn't thought about this. You know, they weren't focusing on what's going on. So then they have to kind of scramble like, oh, we're going this other way. Which way are we going? Is it left or is it right? And then they both say different directions. Mm, Okay. it's, It's just cascading set of problems. Okay. And the captain was expecting a course to runway 21. The first officer thought they might be going to a different runway to runway 32. The captain became confused. Then once the aircraft gets back on course, the controller instructs them to descend to 600 meters. Uh, around this time, the crew finally understood they're actually lining up for runway 21. Okay. After a few minutes, the controller then asked if the crew was descending because now his radar shows them at 1,800 meters. <laughs> he told them to go down to 600, and now they're at 1,800. And that's, uh-huh. I mean, <laughs> that's a big difference. This triggered an intense reaction from the captain who emotionally asked, how low must we descend? How low must we descend? What? Right. (laughs) He already knows this. The first officer said 600 meters and then started to ask himself why the airplane was not descending. And this is the first officer saying this, not air traffic control? Right. Because air traffic control has already told them 600 meters. Yeah. And the captain is like, he, he's acting like he doesn't know. Did they rise or did they just not descend enough? No, they, they were climbing. They were at 1,800 meters when they should have been at 600. But why? 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 I guess you don't know. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's at this point, the first officer starts asking, wait, why are we climbing? And the reason is they had configured their autopilot in a way where it prioritized reducing speed before descending. So the autopilot waited for it to hit the correct speed and then it started to descend. So this shows that the first officer had insufficient knowledge of the auto flight modes and the combinations. The captain then became annoyed at the first officer and started to berate him on what he should have done. Mm -hmm. So when they reached 600 meters, the airspeed reached 130 knots. They continued to descend. The first officer then started to increase the throttles. And at first they were synchronous, but then there was a thrust split. This started the plane to bank to the left and to compensate, the autopilot applied right wheel up, but it was not enough to compensate. So the plane continued to bank to the left. The first officer then applied more right wheel and switched the autopilot to control wheel steering roll mode, but also inadvertently turned on control wheel steering pitch mode as well. The first officer was so focused on the roll that he did not notice the pitch increase. So, you know, he's trying to fight with this asymmetric thrust. The plane's winding a bank. You know, he switches it to the wrong flight mode. The plane pitch starts to increase. Again, the air traffic controller notices that they're climbing again (laughs) and informs Uh the crew, hey, now you're at 900 meters. He then instructs the crew to turn right heading 360 and to descend to 600, which the captain confirmed, but then started to discuss with the controller the possibility of landing without making a second approach. So they're like, circle back around and do it right. And he's like, but what if we didn't? Well, like the the captain's worried that they're going to have to do a go around and make a second approach. And the captain's like, well, like you said, like, well, what if we don't? What if we just land? (laughs) The controller then repeated his instructions three times with the captain confirming each time, but the crew did not follow them. Like... He's saying, go do this. He's like, nah. Right. The captain's repeating it, but he's not adhering to it. While communicating with the controller, it's believed the captain was interfering with the controls by increasing the bank angle abruptly to try to get back on the landing course instead of turning around. So he's not turning. He's trying to continue his landing procedure. Uh. The first officer was asking what the captain's doing, and he managed to get the wings back to level, but the aircraft also started to climb again and they didn't notice because they're arguing. Because it's got, it's got the wrong... They're in the wrong mode, right? It's pitching up. The throttles were also still asymmetric, and the plane began to bank some more, about one degree per second. After the bank angle reached 30 degrees and the speed lowered to below 130 knots, the first officer told the captain to take the plane. But the captain responded with, I can't do it either. Oh. But then the captain abruptly increases the bank angle from 30 degrees to 76. So he just makes it way worse. Wait, so why, why would he do that? He didn't understand the attitude indicator. Remember we talked about this earlier? Tur- oh, because the, the reverse. <laughs> right. ah. So this just shows that the pilot in command, he just had like a psychological breakdown. He lost his composure. He panicked. And the attitude indicator wasn't the style he's used to. He thinks they're banking to the right. So he banks more to the left. But in reality, oh. they're already banked way too far to the left. And they're in this cycle of trying to land and then it rising back up because it's an, uh, the wrong autopilot. And right. going back. It's just like this cascading series of errors. So the, the co-pilot reacts immediately to the erroneous actions from the pilot in command. And uh-huh. he, you know, he yells out, on the contrary, in the opposite direction. And he's, you know, he starts trying to recover the aircraft from this deep bank. Yeah. So this, you know, this confirms the first officer was at least aware of the bank direction, but the, you know, the pilot in command isn't. Mm-hmm. From 11.09 p.m. universal time until the end of the flight, the pilot in command was the pilot flying. So the captain was 
flying the plane. The abrupt, disproportionate wheel roll inputs directed both ways without any pitch control assume that the pilot in command lost spatial orientation, misinterpreting the Western type attitude indicator. So, you know, it was night, it was dark, he couldn't see anything, so he's going off his instruments. Mm -hmm. He misinterprets the instrument. He thinks it's the other kind. And so he's banking in the wrong direction. The co-pilot sees all this happening, tries to stop him. However, the pilot in command was not able to assess the situation adequately. He made a critical error, abruptly applying left wheel almost full. So the aircraft makes an almost full barrel roll with the nose down pitch increasing to 65 degrees. So they're like pointed down at the ground and they do a full roll. And it was impossible to recover from such a position without enough altitude. Yeah, because they're too, at that point, they're only what, like? Well, 600 meters is what, like less than 2,000 feet, more or less about 2,000 feet? Yeah. So yeah, they're really low and they pitch down, do a barrel roll, uh, and they had a vertical acceleration of 4.3 G. Wow. So I know you keep asking, why is the captain doing this? Why, why is this happening? He was drunk. What? Yeah. He was drunk? Before the plane took off, while they were still taxiing, you know, the captain makes announcements to the passengers in the cabin. One of the passengers actually sent a text message before takeoff to a friend and said she was scared because the captain sounded, quote, like he is totally drunk. Oh, my God. Yeah. uh, Apparently, if you listen to the uh, cabin announcements he makes, he's slurring. He gets the flight number wrong all the time. He gets the time wrong. So he is wasted drunk. Not like, oh, he had a couple drinks. He's like... I don't remember off the top of my head what his blood alcohol level is, but I want to say that they said it was between 0.08 and 0.11. And here in the United States, you know, you cannot legally drive a car if it's 0.08 or higher. And the blood alcohol content for flying is 0.04 in the U.S. So, and you have to wait at least eight hours after drinking alcohol before flying. So, yeah, he was definitely beyond what he should have been for flying. Mm-hmm. Which, again, contributes to this. You know, he's not, can't react as quickly, making the wrong decisions. <sighs> it's uh. awful. He was, on top of not being qualified to fly this plane, he was also drunk. They weren't both drunk, were they? No, no, it was just the captain, the pilot in command. But pilot in command probably knew it, though, right? Uh, oh, you mean the first officer probably knew? yeah. Yeah, the first officer probably, if I had to guess, he probably suspected that the captain was drunk. I mean, I don't know that he ne- you could smell the alcohol on him. But, you know, when you're around someone who's been drinking, you can normally smell it on them, right? Yeah. And the way he was slurring, I, again, I've listened to the cockpit voice recorder. Uh, I don't speak Russian, so I can't speak to it. But the way the captain talks sounds very different than the way that the first officer yeah. speaks or that the air traffic control speaks. So the immediate cause of the accident was spatial disorientation of the crew, especially the captain, who was the pilot flying at the final stage of the flight which led them to flip over, perform the steep descent, and crash the aircraft. Spatial disorientation was experienced during nighttime operation in clouds with both autopilot and autothrottle disengaged. Contributing to the development of the spatial disorientation and failure to recover from it was lack of proficiency in aircraft handling, crew resource management, and of skills associated with upset recovery using Western-type attitude indications that are found on foreign and modern Russian-made aircraft. So even modern Russian aircraft now use the same kind of attitude indicators that we use over here. That's good. Either way, I mean, I don't... Just as long as it's consistent. (laughs) Yeah, as long as they know, right? As long as they don't have to transition from one to another. So the cause above was determined on the basis of flight recorders and air traffic control recorder data analysis, examination of the airframe and engine wreckage, results of the accident flight simulation... Findings of the independent expertise conducted by test pilots from State Research Institute of Civil Aviation and Gromov Flight Research Institute, as well as line pilots and so on, the basis of all the works conducted with participation of experts from Bermuda, France, Russia, UK, and USA, all of the course of investigation. So they're just kind of saying, hey, we came to this conclusion because of all of this, and we had a lot of people helping us out try to come to the conclusion. The systematic cause of the accident was insufficient management by the airline of flight and maintenance operations of the Boeing 737 type aircraft. These deficiencies in the aircraft maintenance were also revealed through safety inspections conducted by the Russian Transport Oversight Authority and the Russian CAA after the accident. Deficiencies in the aircraft maintenance led to a situation where flights were performed for a long time with a throttle stagger that exceeded the limitations in the aircraft maintenance manual, and when the maintenance staff did not follow the aircraft maintenance manual, recommended troubleshooting procedures. The need to manage the throttle stagger during the approach increased crew workload. So again, they're just kind of bad-mouthing the maintenance and the fact that the crew had to worry about this asymmetric thrust, which increased their workload when they were already subpar pilots to begin with. 
The forensic medical examination performed in the state health care center of special status confirmed the presence of ethyl alcohol in the captain's body before his death. The captain's recent work schedule during the time period before the accident was conducive to fatigue and did not comply with national regulations. So he was also overworked, didn't have enough rest, and drunk on top of everything else. Mm. So there were some recommendations, of course, obviously, yeah, as yeah. a result of, of this incident. It was consider the practicality of increasing requirements to flight training programs and transition training programs and elaborate a mandatory syllabus minimum for every aircraft type in order to improve the level of training and avoid simplifications during the training. Better training. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Develop a CRM training program for flight crews that fly two member crew aircraft and ensure this program is mandatory for flight personnel who transition from multi-crew aircraft. So again, better CRM for people who move from four crew aircraft to two crew aircraft. Ensure that the aviation psychologists, when selecting personnel for transitioning training, should pay attention to the personality traits of the candidates with regard to their emotional reactions and behavior in abnormal situations. And if they find negative traits, should give recommendations on their suitability for transition training and or the necessity of individual approach during training. So again, be a little more selective about who you transition from one aircraft to another. This guy obviously had a kind of a short fuse and, yeah, uh, yeah. and was uh, inebriated at the time. I mean, was this, had he gotten in trouble for this before? I can't answer that for certain. I don't know. I didn't read about him being in trouble for anything like this before when looking into this incident. I want to say no, but I can't say that definitively. Yeah. Arrange and conduct research of spatial disorientation and upset conditions and develop practical safety measures. Based on the research results, develop and implement a special flight crew training course that would contain theory and practice. So again, more training specifically for spatial disorientation. Amend transition training and commissioning requirements onto new aircraft type to establish the minimum value of flight hours on the new aircraft type that are required before returning to previous aircraft type. You see, there's a pattern here. It's training, 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 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, pr practically all of these. Consider the practicality of using aircraft with Western type attitude indicators at colleges of initial flight training. While Russian training aircraft of such type would be designed, consider the practicality of acquiring Western aircraft suitable for initial training. As an alternative measure, consider installing Western type attitude indicators on the already used Russian training aircraft. And we talked about that. Now, modern Russian aircraft do use Western style attitude indicators. Consider the necessity of inspecting the level of training of pilots who were trained for Boeing 737 at the FTI Center and the Flight Training Center of St. Petersburg State University of Civil Aviation. On the basis of inspection, consider the necessity of additional training. So maybe let's go back and look at all the pilots who've been trained here. <laughs> yeah, make sure that there aren't other... Right, that there aren't other pilots who slipped through the cracks. Require that certified staff approved for maintaining a certain type of aircraft should be present during pre-flight inspections, especially if the aircraft is dispatched with minimum equipment list items. And the last one here, ensure that the flight personnel strictly follow standard operating procedure. Ensure continuous monitoring of flights using, among other means, cockpit voice recording records readout. So just follow the procedures. They're there for a reason. I mean, I feel like that's the, that's the overall theme of our podcast. Just follow the rules, man. Follow the checklists. They're all there for a reason. If he'd done what he'd been told, would he, st I mean, I don't know, who knows if they still would have landed correctly, because like, I didn't know what he was doing. Right. Uh, it, it's hard. To, he didn't know what he was doing, and he was drunk. They were arguing. They weren't paying attention to the plane. It's hard to say. Maybe, maybe if they had, you know, followed the air traffic control's instructions, they would have given them more time to assess what was going on, think about it, and come in for their landing. Yeah. He was just kind of in a rush, didn't want to circle didn't want to make a second go around i can't i don't know it's all speculation but yeah i mean that's it that's uh that's this incident man that was frustrating it's so frustrating it's unbelievable to me that you know in 2008 this still happened that that's not that long ago and yeah. you know you feel like this was entirely preventable this shouldn't have happened yeah this is one of the now i feel like a lot of times we, the true crime part of this right he would have gone to jail if he had lived right Oh, most definitely. That would have been like major jail. Yeah, that would definitely have been, you know, criminal charges if uh, if he had survived that. This airline, it was just, you know, even though I said it was Aeroflot 821, it was actually like a regional airline, a subsidiary of Aeroflot called Aeroflot Nord. That airline had to rebrand after this. I believe, I forget what they rebranded to, like Nordovia. Uh, and then Aeroflot actually sold off that line. It's a, it's a different airline now. Like, I mean, it was such a bad crash that Aeroflot Nord no longer exists. A mm. little bit of trivia also, actually. This plane crashed into 
some railroad tracks. It crashed into the Trans-Siberian Railway. So like train traffic had to be routed for a while while they had to repair the train tracks. Yeah, because they, yeah, they hit the, the train. Yeah, luckily there was no train going at the time, but they did hit the tracks. It's just weird that it impacted that. And, you know, there's all this other collateral damage that happens as a result of it. Yeah. But that's it. That's Aeroflot 821. One of the more frustrating episodes that we're probably yeah. going to cover, I think. I know we say lots of these are preventable, but this was just like gross negligence. Yeah, this was, this was, that's why I was like, he should be in jail. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah, the thing I was going to post, I know I'm going to, what I'll do on social media, I'm going to post the different style attitude indicators. Oh yeah. The Western style and the Russian style. That way, if you're unclear about what that looks like, that way you'll see side by side what the difference is and why this confusion can happen. So I'll definitely post that. I'll see what else I can find to post because, you know, there's not much to this one. It was a pretty bad crash. Uh, maybe I'll post some of the damage to the train tracks. But yeah, go check out social media if you definitely want to see what the difference in the attitude indicators is. Yeah, at Black Box Down Pod. Yep. And don't forget, we've got some merch. We've got some shirts, got bumper stickers, got a mug. I love the mug. Uh, you can go look for them at store.roosterteeth.com. Or in our link tree. Or in our link tree. You love that link tree. I also want to let you know, if you're looking for another podcast to listen to, there's another podcast Chris and I are involved in. It's called Tales from the Stinky Dragon. It's a little different from this podcast. A little different, but in a good way. In a good way. Yeah, it's a true play Dungeons and Dragons podcast. You don't have to know anything about D&D. It's more like a improv comedy storytelling. If you've never listened to a D&D thing or it sounds boring, or just give it a listen because it's super fun. I'd never played D&D really before the past year and doing this podcast is one of my favorite things. Obviously, besides Black Box Down, that's my other favorite. Just search for Tales from the Stinky Dragon wherever you listen to the podcast, wherever you listen to this podcast. I'm sure you'll find it there. Just give the first episode a try. Uh, I think you'll like it. And if you want to follow me on social media, it's at Chris Damaris. And Gus is at what? At Sorola. It's my last name. S-O-R-O-L-A. If you ever want to you know, follow on uh, any other content that we make, because we make a whole bunch of stuff. True. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you guys again next week. Bye.